Oh, I'd like to start by thanking you all for coming today to listen to this, what promises to be a very interesting series of talks in, the, in this very interesting and developing field of unconventional resources. I'd like to thank Finding Petroleum for inviting IHS to come along to present some of our work and what we're doing here in, in, this, in this area. We're, this is a bit of a promotional talk that's promoting some of the work we're doing at IHS. It's a, the product we're developing and a bit of a develop, bit of a promotion for those talks. So I hope, it, I hope rather than being a bit of a hard sell, I'm hoping there's a bit of a technical background as well to my talk. I work, for, I work with the unconventional team at IHS. We've got a small team, based, some are based in Geneva, I'm based here in the UK, we have other, other member based in the, in the US. <coughs> So to give a bit of background about the talks, from the start I'll give a background to put a bit into context of what we're doing at, 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 uh, at IHS. Now I'm going to introduce the unconventional team, which feel that we've got a pretty unique new thing at IHS. We've got a team dedicated specifically to looking at uh, unconventionals and <coughs> solely working on the unconventional <coughs> aspects of the IHS's work. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the project, a bit of the background, a bit of our workflows, what we're doing, and some of the Bit of a bit of bit more science, bit more of the technical aspects of the um, resource and estimation models we're producing. Then I'm going to give a case study. It seems, as we heard already, it seems to be it doesn't seem to a day goes by without hearing some stories about fracking in the UK and CBM and shale gas in the UK. So I'm going to thought I'd highlight some of the work we're doing here in IHS on the UK on the UK's work. So we're looking at Bowling Shale and the coal bed methane coal fields around the UK. Then I'm going to briefly. Show, talk about the product, if you subscribe to the IHS on the Metro product, what you, what you can expect to get, and then summary conclusions at the end. So this is a graph that I took out of the EIA website just yesterday, and it shows how the EIA predict that shale gas is going to form a much larger um, proportion of the uh, gas production in the US in the coming years towards 2040, as we move out towards 2040. And together with the tight gas and the CBM, the unconventionals are expected to produce what it looks like about well over 60% of the US gas production. Now, the, effect, the effect that's had since 2008 when gas prices in the US spiked at around about $13 per MMBTU. And just last week, they were about $3.5 per MMBTU. And they've been stable at around $3.5 per MMBTU for a period of time now. And so the shale gas boom has in some way helped to the economic recovery in the US lowering gas prices. We're seeing the US now becoming, we're hearing that US now becoming a net exporter of, of gas. And uh, IHS, we've taken this very seriously. If this analog can be um, referred to back to the rest of the globe, we can expect to see a similar <coughs> pattern emer emerging within other global plays. So we've taken this very seriously, we've developed a team that's looking specifically at modeling and mapping where the shale gas and shale oil horizons are globally. So at IHS, we, we maintain a dyna dynamic white paper, which we're updating constantly with our terminology and phrasing to, uh, to each of these unconventional plays. Initially, we've been looking at the shale gas and the shale oils and the carbon methane, is there, and looking at the major basins that have been developed and explored at the moment. Once we've, once we've finished mapping all the major basins, we're then going to go back and try and map some of the smaller basins. And then, once the smaller basins are complete, we'll, we'll start looking at some of the newer other unconventional, mm -hmm. such as gas hydrates. So how's that look? The project's about a year old. It started in just about a year ago, and we identified there's about 500 plays globally which we want to map. And by the end of 2015 is when our mapping phase is going to come to an end. We, 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 anticipate, we'll, we anticipate we'll have all of these plays mapped as we can see. So far to date, we've mapped a large part of Europe. It's complete. There's a few basins left to finalise and complete. We've mapped a huge, major part of Northern Europe. Parts of Siberia have been mapped and are now up, up, and up online. Parts of North America, South America, some of the major basins in those, those, those continents have been mapped. I've just finished mapping the Indonesia, and I'll be moving on to Australia in the next couple of weeks. Then in the years to come, in 2014, 2015, we'll be looking to start maps on these basins in uh, Africa and the Middle East and across into China. It's quite a slow process. Mapping each of these places is quite a, quite a long, slow process. We're trying to map the geology in as much detail as we possibly can and try to accurately map the formation tops and the isopack data as, as much as we can. So it's quite a slow process. If you finally got basins which have several plays, several shell horizons, it then the, the process gets a lot more complicated. It takes a lot more time to map these horizons. So this is why it's quite a long project out to 2015. 
quite a long introductory to map all of these major plays. <coughs> so I mentioned we've got a dedicated team at IHS, uh, led by Prithi Yas in Geneva, and each member of the team has their own speciality expertise they bring to the project. There's Francois, Francois who is, um, who's been in charge of mapping the, uh, developing the shale gas model, the shale play reservoir, res reservoir model. There's Cyril, who is in charge of developing the, uh, maintaining the database. Myself, I've developed the coal bed methane uh, reserve estimation tool. And Pierre has developed the uh, play mapper, semi-automatic play mapper tool, which we use to delineate our polygons, showing where, the, where our uh, sweet spots are. Then Brian, who's recently joined, who's based in the States, who's going to be mapping some of the northern North America's parts of the plates. And all of us are in charge of mapping parts of the globe, various parts of the globe, and getting these maps and getting the plays up, up and lined. So IHS, a huge company, uh, looking at various large amounts of um, different uh, 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 industries around the globe. We've got interest in the financial sector, we've got interest in the automotive sector, and historically we've had a lot of interest in the energy sector, in upstream and downstream. And during that time we've developed a massive database, a huge database of, of oil and gas information. We've got information down to an individual well, from when the well was spudded to what formation the top that well encountered, and how much production that well created. Up to the field level we can tell you how much of, um, reserves are taken from that field and to the base level which, which formation has actually been targeted. So we have a huge database which we initially can target very quickly to gather information on our, on our plays. Then to supplement that we do further searches into um, industrial papers, industrial conferences and the scientific journals to further our understanding of each of these basins. We collect that data, collect that information, pull it together, add it to our resource estimates and produce what we think is the un unique unconventional content that's I'm not available anywhere else today. You can download, we, give, we produce reports which has um, detailed in, uh, geological information, development history, uh, exploration history, and then you can download the spatial content as well. You can download our shape files with our polygons of play maps as well to, to analyse in, in your own leisure. How does that look? In a, di in a slightly different workflow, how does that look? We you collect our data, we build isopack plots and build surface plots and we build TFC and maturity plots of each of our plays. We clean that data to remove any statistical anomalies from the gridding processes on the, on the, on the, on the, on the work. And then, then that information is then fed into our plane map where we, where we build polygons which delineate our regions of shale oil, shale gas or shale condensates. Then that information is then <coughs> published to Eden which is our online uh, browser tool which you can then download the information, download the reports and, for, for, and, and the spatial layers for your, for your own um, for your own um, uh, usage. Some of the tools we use are industry standard, uh, well used software packages, and they're owned by IHS. So there's Petra and there's Kingdom. Petra is a, is a tool we use for handling off borehole information. We can build our geological surfaces, we can build cross sections, we can build a lot of good, 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 good ge geological data, and then TFC and maturity plots within Petra. And then if we want, we can use Kingdom. We can use Kingdom to uh, analyse any seismic data we have to build seismic surfaces to, to supplement our geological data. Having these as in-house tools is useful for us. It means we can very quickly talk to the experts and developers how to, how to do certain things within the, within the software because they're quite large packages and they're quite difficult to use. So it's good for us to be able to talk to people very quickly to, to use them. So that concludes the flow aspect to the, to the work. I now want to talk a little bit about the... Um, resource estimations, a bit about a little bit about um, how we do the resource estimation tools. We're looking at shales and we're looking at coals, two similar but very different types of rocks. Shales with TOCs typically from about 0.1 up to 10%. We would consider a TOC greater than 1% would be a prospective shale. Reflective values 0.5 to 3, anything less than 0.5, we're looking at a fairly immature shale, and then anything above say probably about two to three we're looking at the shells probably over mature and there's no gas present <laughs> and a relatively dense dense material. The coals, fixed carbon slightly different material, fixed carbon about 20 to 95 percent lower rank coals lower carbon concentration as you increase the rank of the coal you increase the, car the carbon content of that coal and reflectance values increase similarly as you increase the rank the reflectance values increase. And it's a less, quite a low density material, which makes it quite useful, quite nice for seismic exploration to find because it's a low density. 
So what's important for us then is to understand how the gas is actually stored within, within, these, within these rocks. In the conventional type reservoirs, we find the gas is generally stored as free gas within the pore spaces, whereas in shale gases and coals, our, our, our gas is a mixture of adsorbed gas on the organic matter and, and, and free gas. And that has an effect on the, on the production curves we see. We see an unconventional type field. We get a very fast high flow initially after the fracking operations, then gas flow declines quite quickly and then stable out on this length of this point in the graph can extend for a long period of time as the gas is slowly desorbed <coughs> off the organic matter and, then, and the gas in that gas is gradually produced. Whereas in a conventional gas field, you might want to ramp up production very quickly to get your payback, try and maintain as long, steady flow rate as possible before the, that well starts to decline at the end of its life. So understanding these things gives us a bit more of understanding how the gas is diffused from the coal and then you can understand a bit more about the, the uh, gas compressibility within these, the, the, within these, these rock, rock types. Other things we need to understand is we're looking at shales, for example. This is a Van Crevelen type plot. Uh, what, we, what we need to understand is our carriage and types we're looking at. Whether we're type 1 up to type 3 because these different carriage and types will evolve different different types of gases and, and oils. And if you, have, if you have an understanding of the kerogen types and the Rocky Valley information, we can then make calculations about the hydrogen index, initial hydrogen index, and make some idea about what kind of gases we're going to have left within that coal, well, how much gas is involved and how much gas is remaining within the shale. But initially, what's quite nice to have is the reflected data exactly give us an initial idea of where we are within the oil and gas window. So anything above 0 0.5, we're just entering into the oil window. Then anything above 1.15, we're just entering into the wet gas window. And then anything above 1.4, we're starting to enter into the dry gas window. And as we go up in the reflectance, we get to the, 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 the um, rock becomes over mature. And then we're also looking for TOCs greater than 1% for, for prospective resources. What also is important for us is to understand whereabouts the gas is stored within that shale. This is a zoomed in micrograph of a, of a shale deposit. We've got the kerogen. There's a dark matter and the pore spaces in between. And what we're beginning to understand now is that the majority of the gas is probably stored within this organic matter as adsorbed on, onto, the, onto the prostate within the, this organic matter. So if we zoom out a bit further, we find the organic matter is fairly sparsely distributed throughout this shale. And what we want to understand, therefore, is trying to work out the differences between our gross shale and our net shale. Is our TOC uniformly spread throughout the shale, or are we going to encounter organic rich regions within each shale deposit, which would be the target, main target for exploration because that's where, if that's where all the gas is stored. So looking at things like, things like the petrophysical logs and trying to un understand our shales, yeah. trying to understand if we're going to likely to get organic rich zones, like a coal field, like coal deposits, organic rich horizons, or whether the shale is going to be uniformly spread with organic matter throughout, throughout that shale. So that becomes very important when, when we're doing our reserve estimates to try and understand the difference between our net shale gas and our, and our, and our, and our and our, our gross shale gas shale. Then we move on to coal. As we increase our rank of coal, we increase the reflectance values, and the moisture content decreases, the calorific value tends to increase, and the carbon content increases as well. Knowing this is quite useful to then understand what, what type of coal we're dealing with. And we look at the laboratory experiments, we see that high rank coals, anthracites, tend to hold greater concentrations of gas. You can store more gas onto an anthracite because there's more carbon available for the gas to absorb onto the surface of the coal within the matrix. And so in the field, as we see in South Wales, certainly the anthracitic coals, high rank coals, tend to hold higher concentrations of gas. So if we know a little bit about the, uh, the, the proximate analysis of the coal, we know a little bit about what the coal, coal makeup is, we can make some estimation, some calculation of what our gas content will be in that coal. And then we need to also need to then know how many coal seams we have and our completable coal thickness, what sort of volumes of coal we're dealing with. <coughs> so we can make our estimations of the, coal, con the gas concentration in the coal. And then we have to, then we report this data as um, initially as total petroleum in place and then report it to the, um, the 2P level of reserves. Total petroleum in place is all reported to our P50 levels, <coughs> so it's kind of our average estimation we have. We report it to the P50. And then we look at analogues in the United States and in the shale gas fields and analogues in the um, 
I'd like to see Benfield to try and understand what kind of gas concentrations are realistic as a reserve or how much of that gas can actually realistically get out of the ground. Looking at shale oil, the, we, we think around 10% of the shale oil might be able to get out of the ground. Shale gas, perhaps as high as 20%. <clears throat> And just to show, this isn't a, we don't produce static models that remain um, models that are uploaded and stay like that as for, for, forever. What, as, as we get more information of the fields, as the fields become more developed and more explored, we are constantly updating our, updating our models. So we start off with our data mining, produce our geological models. Geological models are then fed into the play mapper. From the play mapper, we get our volumetrics, we then calculate our resource estimations. Then that data is uploaded to the database. Published, published with Eden, and then as we get more information, as more people start developing these fields, developing these plays, and developing the basins, we can then update our models, constantly updating the models over time. So whilst the mapping, mapping phase of our, mod, our work is going to end in 2015, the project will continue further on there as we constantly updating the work we've produced and updating those models. So that, that, that concludes the, uh, the workflow and a bit about bit of an introduction, a bit of an idea of what we're doing on the background to our work. I just thought I'd now give a small case study, a short case study on the UK geology, some of the work we've been doing in the UK. <coughs> As you know, in the UK is a vast uh, wealth of uh, rock types from the, throughout the, pretty much covering most of the geological record with from the older rocks, based on the west coast, northwest of Scotland and west coast of Wales, and you've got rocks generally getting drifted young as we go towards the southeast. So what I'm interested to talk about today is the uh, the Carboniferous rocks of the UK. This shows where they outcrop. So the Westphalian coals, Westphalian is where the majority of the coals are located. In Scotland, it's slightly different. We have some deeper coals within the Murian, lower coal, limestone coal measures. <coughs> and most of the coals are stored within, within, within the Westphalian measures. This is where it shows where they outcrop. <coughs> then the Boland Shale is a Murian to Visian uh, unit <coughs> outcropping across the spine of the Pennines. Here, as th as these, these, these are the rocks I'm going to talk about uh, uh, now. And so we've got quite a, quite a good uniform spread throughout the UK of uh, coal, coal measures. So, so look, looking at the Boland, at IHS we're also release agents for oil and gas well data, so we can access oil and gas well data as it becomes publicly available very quickly. And we've, we've you looked at our database, done our mapping, and this is where we think the Boland Shale is... Um, present, or rocks, should I say, of lower Pendelian age and Brigantian age. This is where we think these rocks are present within, within the UK, is their extent. So it covers most of <coughs> northern England, from East Irish Sea Basin across to the, across to the uh, north, 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 northeast coast, draping across the Pennines. A large, a large unit of, uh, of, 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 of shale. If I zoom in a bit closer, this shows the main, main license areas, license holders on, uh, located above this, this unit. And then some of the ideas, some of the 3D images we can produce. If you can imagine we're standing up in somewhere in Scotland looking down towards Kent. This is the Cheshire Basin with a, quite a large vertical exaggeration. Then the uh, uh, East Irish Sea Basin and heading up towards the North Sea. These are the, some ideas, some of the, we can visualise this data within the Petra software. We can actually visualise our 3D plots in, in, uh, to give them an idea of the geology. It's quite useful to be able to see geology in three dimensions for, to, to, for the mapping. So once you've completed the mapping, we put the, the run the data through our play mapper, and we produce maps to look a little bit like this. You have grey areas, in which are non-perspective regions, and these regions can be non-perspective for a number of reasons. They can either be too shallow, too thin, the, uh, the, the rock type may be considered to be over-mature, or it could be under-mature. So in this case, we see a large area running down the spine of the Pennines, where the Boland Shale is outcropping, it's, very, and it's, it's, too, it's too shallow to be considered for perspective. What we get are shale regions, shale gas regions, which is a red, located conveniently beneath the quadrilla sites, license area, and that's draped by a shale condensate, gas condensate, and then that's draped by a shale oil play, which extends towards the south of the Cheshire Basin. And then similarly across the east, on the eastern side of the Pennines, we have a shale oil, shale gas play towards the north, extending down towards the shale oil play as we go further south. 
And the resource estimate I've shown here is just for this region on the <coughs> western side of the Boland, western side of the Pennines. The reason for this is that this basin, these shales form part of a much larger basin system, which we call the Anglo-Dutch Basin, which extends across into the North Sea out towards Holland and the Netherlands. And we're still in the process of finalising the mapping of that basin, so we're not releasing this data just yet. But uh, it's... it's um, it's quite a huge, quite a huge, quite a huge region. But nevertheless, what we, what we estimate in the in the western part of the Boland is that we've got a oil in place around 43 billion barrels of oil, and about 97 uh, TCF of gas. And as a recoverable, as I said earlier, we reckon about 10% of the, that oil might be recoverable, perhaps. That's uh, so a 4.3 billion barrels of oil. And then as a gas, it's about 20 TCF. Looking at UK product consumption, it's about 3 TCF per year. So we're looking something perhaps around about six or seven years of gas supply within this within this region. Still quite a significant volume potentially to, to be to be to be used. So moving on to the coal fields, this, this shows the extent of all the coal fields in the UK, as we've, uh, we've we understand. <coughs> so to date, we've mapped the Midland Valley the Scottish coal fields. This you the, the, the Pennines, and I'm going to present data for the, this large swath that goes from the East Irish Sea down through Cheshire, through the Derbyshire, then down to the uh, Wiltshire and Oxfordshire, the Castile Coffer there, and the South Wales. At some point in the near future, we're going to come back and map the Somerset coalfield around Bristol and Bath, and then have a look at this coalfield around Kent and the Northumberland coalfield. So if we zoom in onto the Scottish coalfield, the Main area, main area of exp exploration at the moment is just under this area here, the end of the Firth and Forth. It's quite a large coal field, very deep within Firth and Forth here. And if you run that data for our map, for our mapping tool, we find we get regions that look a bit like this. It's a un fairly uniform rank across this coal field of bituminous coal. We get these regions, and it gives a resource estimate of around 6 TCF, about 1.1 recoverable. Then moving on to South Wales, a very interesting coalfield for myself. Uh, heavily mined, slightly, incredibly heavily mined coalfield, um, and forms a, a large synclinal structure with a platform high in the middle. The eastern portion has been very heavily mined historically. Interesting in many ways that the coal rank increases from southwest, southeast to northwest. We get petunias coals draping around the southwest, and as we go up towards the northwest, sorry, <coughs> the colouring increases to an anthracite grade. Not so heavy mine in the south in the in the western portion. It's not quite so heavy mine because the coal gets tends to get deeper and the structure gets a bit more complicated. So it's not been so heavily mined across this area. What we see is that we get higher gas concentrations within this part of that coal field. Then looking in cross section, the south is very steeply dipping on the southern limb and the northern limb slightly more shallower dipping. And interestingly, the only remaining coal mines within this coal field are actually based along the North Crop. It used to be well over several hundred coal mines within South Wales, and now there's cut on the hand the amount of coal, coal mines that are left, just located across this North Crop. So if we run the information for our model, what we get is a region of anthracite from the north, and then a lower rank coals towards the south, and we get gas concentrations of around 7.3 in place and 1.4 recoverable. And most of that gas is stored up in this, this region in the north and the northwest. And finally, onto the England coal fields, extending from the East Irish Basin down through the Cheshire Basin, through Derbyshire into the and into the concealed coal field in Oxfordshire and Wiltshire. Large, large area. Put that data for our model. And we find these are prospective regions that we think uh, are going to be perspective for CBN. It's quite a large area, quite a large area down towards um, this area. And the volumes are quite large gas, gas in place about 41.2, quite large volumes. The cover was about 8.3. So it's quite a significant volume of gas within 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 that that uh, those, those coal measures we think. So just to put that into context how that looks, put it into a table and I've converted the oil in place Put the oil into a into a gas equivalent, 
So all of those plays I've showed today, which we've mapped, we think there's around about 400 TCF in place <coughs> from, from our modeling, which equates about 56, about 10 to 20% of that gas might be extractable. It's about 56 TCF recoverables. Which is possibly, if we continue gas supply at the current rate, is, rate of consumption in the UK, it's about 18 years. However, large portions of this, these, these, these units will be located under urban areas, Manchester, Liverpool, and it's been unlikely that we'll be able to extract the gas from those regions. And in, in so many cases with the geology as well, as we look at it in more detail, the, the, the coal seams may not be all that suitable. So this number almost certainly will come down as, as, as we get to refine the model, but still there's a fairly significant volume of, of gas that's, 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 that's in situ. So look at the product. If you subscribe to IHS, what, what the product you get is you, you, you can get a on, online you get the report, which gives the reserve estimates, gives some geological history, some development history, and then we get the maps that show the um, maturity plots and the, the <coughs> ice pack data and the TOC data. Then we get some geological images from cross sections as well. And on top of that, we get the spatial layers we downloaded, so the tops and the ice packs and the maturity data we downloaded to be used within the ORNGOS packages. Look at it again. We can do the search in Eden, which is our online, online browser tool which you can use to do the searches. Search for the basin you want. <coughs> download these reports. In this, this particular report, we have some geochemistry information. Then the maps. This is a Vacamurta basin in um, Argentina. And also, we get some other graphs in this basin. We get graphs of various shareholders who's, um, who has a major interest in that basin, some of the drilling curves and drilling learning curves, <coughs> drilling rigs by operators. We might have some uh, additional geochemistry information on the mineralogy of those of those um, of those uh, uh, those rock types, and also some Van Krebelen diagrams to give an idea of what kind of kerogen we, we have. So, in conclusion, we have a unique uh, we have a de dedicated team at IHS looking to map the uh, unconventional resources globally and gradually working through the major basins. And once we've completed the major basins, we'll then look at the more mi minor prospects and map those, and developing a unique uh, uh, product that can be used in, for identifying sweet spots and sweet spot horizons of the shale gas and shale oil. <coughs> and that's, that's, that's the end of my talk. Just thank you very much for listening. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, time for a few questions, if you have them, please. Uh, take that one, somebody at the back, wave. <coughs> it would be good if you said who you are and um, which company you're representing. Thank you. Uh, Dick Selly, Imperial College. Dr. Turner, very nice presentation. I was particularly interested in your slide of the Boland Shale, okay. showing the amazing concentric distribution of shale oil condensate and shale gas. Do you not think basin inversion may have affected that distribution? Um, quite possibly. We've um, just plotted the um, maturity from the data we've had available to us to, uh, <coughs> to give us an idea of where the main maturity zones are. So that's given the, that's given that um, pattern you see you see there. So yeah, possibly. Yeah. Thank you. Let me ask a question. Uh, your estimate for the Bowen Shale was. Could you go back to the slide? That, sure. would, that would be that would be good. It's not that far, but that, that one will do. <coughs> that one. I mean, the, as you know, I mean the BGS has mm. published sort of fairly widely in this year, I guess, and their estimate, I think, for the gas in place is about three times that. Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, can you, can, can you put your finger on why, or is that a genuine uncertainty range? I mean, there's sort of yeah, um, two different answers, I suppose. We've kind of been a bit conservative, and when I mentioned we're trying to understand how the TOC is distributed throughout the uh, shale, and we've kind of been a bit more conservative looking at some of the um, well logs and well, in well information to try and understand the sweet spots, trying to get an idea between the difference between the net and the gross shale deposits. So we've kind of we're less because I think we've probably estimated a lower net shale, de shale unit of, of gas than the, um, maybe perhaps BGS have, have estimated. So our large figures are a bit more, well, quite, a lot, quite a lot lower than the BGS Yeah, estimates. I mean, it's more like 300 and something. 1,300 TCF they're estimating, yeah, so quite, quite a lot higher. And have, sorry, um, Terry, down yep. the front here. Thank <laughs> you. 
Um, my name's Kevin. Uh, I work for Sasol. Uh, the question I want to put to you, and perhaps it's a bit more of a challenge, is you, you've got an estimate there that covers the offshore areas, and surely with unconventionals, you've really got to rule out those offshore areas. Uh, recovery uh, is going to require a lot of wells, and it's just not feasible to drill those out in the East Irish Sea, for example. Yeah, we had well, we had some data out into the East Irish Sea, and we just we thought it'd be worth just uh, mapping that and, 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 and quantifying the volumes of gas that might be in place yeah. as technology develops in the future. And they, they may become available for extraction, they may not, but we thought it'd be worthwhile just, just to highlight those, those offshore regions. But I, I agree it's going to be a lot more expensive and a lot harder to extract the gases in, in, those, in those, those environments. So somebody else weighing in. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Sikit from Repsol. I have a question. You have a global uh, unconventional database. Finally, you have a player, a mapper, and a resources. Do you have uh, any uh, economic threshold in its area, its basin? Um, not so much economics. We're, we're purely looking at the geology and trying to understand the sweet spots of where the um, shale oil and shale gas horizons are. So not looking so much at economics at this stage. Um, that may be something that might come into consideration in the future, looking at the weather and the plays we're identifying are actually economical based on <coughs> certain gas prices. But not, not, at, not, not at the moment, though. I think about that answer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Giles Watts, consultant. Um, have you looked at other horizons apart from the Boland Shale? I mean, I'm from, from Dorset, and uh, I've heard very little talk about the Kimridge clay, which should surely be the highest organic content of, uh, of all the shales. Yeah, very good, very good question. We, we initially, because we're under quite a tight program to try and cover as much of the globe as rapidly as possible, we targeted the Boland because at the time last year, the Boland Shale was very much in the news. So we mapped that as fast as we could. And then also mapping the coal bed methane because they were starting to become quite um, high, high priority as well. And the Kimridge clay and all the, um, the, the, the down in the Wessex Basin, those, those deposits there, we, we're going to come back and look at in maybe six, seven months' time and start mapping those, those basins as well to get an idea of what the, what the um, volumes of gas or oil are, are in place there. But certainly, it's certainly well aware of it. And it's just a you know, small team is trying to prioritise the basins as best we can globally. So sure it's, it's on our horizon, yeah. Okay, Matt, another one for me. How many, if you look at, one of the things that strikes me always when I go to the US and listen to people talking about unconventional plays is when you ask them how many wells and logs and cores and previous production history they have, the answer tends to be in the several thousand. How, how many wells do we actually have in the Bowen Trail? I mean, is it 100, 200, 50, how many, how, roughly, with, with calls? It's in the order of hundreds of wells in the Shell. A hundred or hundred? hundred within the hundreds of, oh, I couldn't tell you the exact figure off the top of my head, but there's certainly around within the hundreds we've, we've <coughs> looked at with I, I encountered rocks of those age. Okay. So not like in the States where there's several thousand of wells. Yeah. <laughs> okay, anybody else? I was just going to say, uh, Henry, most of those wells wouldn't have been drilled Okay, all done. All right, thank you. Matt, thank you. Thank you very much.